one of the things that God desires for us is that we're free to know that he's our provider. There's some things that get lost sometimes in our understanding of who we truly are in Christ and what it is that Jesus came to restore right now, not, not when we get to heaven, but right now in, in this life. The kingdom of God is right now in this life. It's not a futuristic there are some things that will take place in the future, glorified bodies and spending forever uh, with him, but eternity has already begun. <laughs> it's just people don't realize that they are not born again, that they're going to spend eternity somewhere. The computer's not going to go blank. <laughs> They're going to remember. That's why it says weeping and gnashing of teeth because there is a remembrance. The weeping is the remembering that I had an opportunity to get it right and I did it. So let's get into the word today. Painful toil. Talking about freedom of provision so we have to go to where it all started. It all started in the book of Genesis. Could you turn that down a little bit? It sounds like a little echo. Just the mic part. It's just, just a hair. Test, test, one, two, one, two, one, two. That's fine. That's fine. That's one, two, okay. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 17 through 19. And I'm going to be reading out of the Common English Bible. Translation and then the New Living Translate. Well, I'm not going to read that. I put the note up there what it says. Let's go to it. Genesis 3 17 through 19. So we know in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Part of that creation was us. That's why we're here. We were the crowning of his creation. In fact, there's a scripture where even the angels marvel, who is man that thou art so mindful of? And why, why are you so mindful of me? We were having a conversation. I think I, somebody asked me a question uh, in regards to, you know, why aren't the angels redeemable? I said, well, that's just a favor of God. Think about it. Satan sinned and that was it. You know, uh, and so... With that, it's like, well, why wouldn't he give them a plan for salvation? Who knows? But God is God. And so, Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Just a second. To the man he said, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree, I commanded, do not eat from it. Cursed is the fertile land because of you. In pain, you will eat from it every day of your life. Weeds and thistles will grow from you, will grow for you, even as you eat the field's plants. By the sweat of your face will eat bread until you return to the fertile land. Since from it 
you were taken, you are soil. To the soil you will return. This this was a curse. Uh, it's one thing for the enemy to try to do something to you. It's another thing for God to pronounce something over you. People have no real, they don't even realize that uh, in the last days or when the rapture happens and the people who are left behind, the wrath of God is going to be poured out. That's something different. Even when the enemy, God gave provision. Okay, Job, you know, you can do this to Job, but, but the wrath of God, God himself. So now this is something that God himself is pronouncing because of disobedience. Of course, we know he told them not to eat of the tree of, the, uh, of uh, knowledge of good and evil, and they did that. And he's pronouncing this curse upon them because of disobedience to God. That's why people, people say, I, he says, I set before you this day life and death, blessings and cursings. And so people will say, well, how can a good God, how can a loving God do this? God is not doing anything. Man chooses it. It's like I set before you Kool-Aid and poison and you chose the poison. Now you're upset with me because your body's deteriorating from the poison you chose. I put before you uh, uh, blessings and cursings and you, put, you, you, chose, the, you chose the cursing. You chose this lifestyle. You chose this, this, this particular set of, this, this road. And so he says, because you have listened to your, your wife's voice. Notice that you listen to your wife's voice. I believe that if Adam had have just told us, listen, we're not going to do that. And so that's a temptation because even in families, we have the temptation to want to listen to mama, to want to listen to brother, to want to listen to cousin, auntie, girl, wife, husband. So we have to listen to the voice of God above everybody else's voice. That's why Jesus said, he who does not hate, and he wasn't meaning in the sense hate, mother, brother, sister, wife, cousin, whoever, I'm just naming all of those things, um, uh, is not worthy of me. He who does not love uh, me above all of those people is not worthy of me. What he's saying is, if you don't choose me, choose my word, then that's, that's the demonstration of your love. That's, 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 the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the depth of your love. When you choose someone else's voice over mine, that shows how much you love me. If I say go left, and the person you love says go right, and you listen to the person that you love, Jesus is saying that's where your allegiance lies. Because you listen to your wife's voice, and then there's consequences. He said because you listen to your wife's voice, and you ate of the tree I commanded, do not eat from it, curse. Is the fertile land because of you. In pain you will eat from it. So what God was saying in the, in the New Living Translation, it says all of your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. People say, well, the work is the curse. No, the work, the work is not the curse. Notice that he cursed the land. He didn't say that the work was cursed. He just said that it would be more difficult for you. What would have normally been easy for you, what have normally just would have been crops just coming up, I've cursed it, so now it's going to be that much more difficult for you to till this land. He talks about weeds and thistles. And so, if you, if I'm going to, I probably, I think I got a, a note here somewhere in regards to weeds and thistles. But we know in the natural, weeds and thistles are something that chokes out the nutrients from the plants. It chokes out the nutrients from the plants. Some of them have poison in them. So it chokes out the nutrients in the crop. It disturbs the process that would have naturally just flowed. He's saying it would have been easy for you, Adam, but you did this and now I'm going to make it difficult for you. That's why he said the way of the transgressor is hard. People have it misconstrued. Oh, it's hard to serve God. No, actually, it's hard to serve the devil. <laughs> it's harder to serve the devil. Amen. Now, he's painted the picture for people that it's difficult for them to serve God. What has happened is people have looked at religion and said that religion is difficult. You're right, religion is difficult. Because it's following a set of rules and regimens. But when you're in a relationship with a loving father, when you have a Holy Spirit that is helping you, it's easy. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Light burden. The only thing that bogs us down is the things that the enemy has placed you to bog us down with. Jesus said, I've come to set you free. He said, I've, changed, I've come to save that which was lost. That relationship, that blessing. And God gives us an illustration of that. But first, I'm going to move to Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, 
starting at verse 7, and I'm reading, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation for this particular portion of Scripture. So it's going to read a little bit different. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a gar planted a garden in Eden, in Eden, in the east, and He placed the man He had made. Placed God's design. So this is before the curse. God's design was to set Adam up for success. God wants to set us up for success if we're in his will. That doesn't mean that everything will be easy. It just means that you're going to be set up to win. God set Adam up. He set us up to win. The Lord God made all sorts of trees from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and dividing into four branches. The first branch called Pishon flowed around the entire land of Havilah, where gold is found. Got provision. Gold. Provision. The gold of the land is exceptionally pure aromatic resin and onyx stone also found there. The second branch called Gihon flowed around the entire land of Cush. The third branch called Tigris flowed of the east of the land of Eshur, the fourth branch called Euphrates. So I want to stop right there because it talks about rivers and the significance of rivers in early civilizations was this. Rivers were attracted to attracted to locations for the first civilizations because they provided a steady supply of drinking water. It made the land fertile, notice it deep, fertile to grow crops. Moreover, goods and people could be transported easily, uh, and the people of the, in these civilizations could fish and hunt the animals that came to drink water. So pause there for a second, and I want to show you something. This is why God says in Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, there's a reason why he put rivers right there surrounding the garden of Eden in Psalms chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 I'm reading out of King James blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law do he meditate day and night. What is the consequence of delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating day and night? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It only comes by meditating on the word of night, word of God day and night, delighting in the law of the Lord. Notice the term, the rivers of water. He shall be planted by rivers of water. Now let's go back to Genesis. Verse 15. Genesis for, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in a garden to tend and watch over it. Notice in verse 15, the original work was not to earn a living. God's job 
was to care was to care for Adam. That was God's job. That's why he placed them in a land that was surrounded by rivers. It was a land that was going to be easy. Not that, not, not that Adam would not work. The work would not be toil. Things that come easy. Wanted to point that out. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. Point out, the original role of the woman was to support Adam in what God's job was for him. That's why she was a helper. She was to help Adam achieve his goal in serving God. So God, so the Lord God formed the ground, for, excuse me, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Notice he gave Adam creative rights. We are creative in nature. That's why the things on the inside of you, some of the things that you just come up with, and you sing, oh, this my another, that's something that God placed on the inside of you. That ability to just come up with ideas and create things comes from God. We are creative by our nature because our nature will derive from our Father. God spoke into darkness and created light. Let there be when there was no. And he brought them unto man to see what he would call them. Still reading in verse 19. And the man chose the name for each one. Notice it didn't say God chose. God gave Adam creative rights to, to name the animals. He gave the names to all the livestock, the birds of the, the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper that just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall in a deep sleep while the man slept. The Lord God took out of, out, excuse me, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib and brought her to the man. See, that's another, that's a whole other teaching. He brought her to, okay. At last, the man exclaimed, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. So we see the original roles. We see everything that God set up from the beginning. But then we saw in verse in chapter three where that flipped because of disobedience. He said, through pain and toil, you will work. Because I've cursed the ground. I've cursed the area. So who's your provider really? So now this is this is in Christ, because some things have changed since that time. Things have changed since that time. Things, God, God did some stuff. He, he sent our Redeemer. He sent a Savior. He sent us someone in the person of Jesus Christ to reverse the curse. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 10. Common English Bible again. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 1. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 1. If I can step a bit here. After these things, the Lord commissioned 72 others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every city and place he was about to go with. He said unto them, the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but, the, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. And there's another translation that says the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I always, you know, I refer to this because, you know, he didn't say uh, the pastors are few. He didn't say uh, there's few evangelists, a few uh, 
He didn't say that there were a few bishops and few deacons and few churchmen. No, he said the laborers are few. The workers. Go be ye warned, though, that I am sending you out as lambs amongst wolves. Carry no wallet, no bag, no sandals. Scared me a little bit. I saw this roll on the floor. I didn't know what it was. But. <laughs> Gotta be real now. What in the world? <laughs> Whenever you enter the house, first say, may peace be on it, on this house. If anyone there shares God's peace, then your peace will be, then your peace will rest on that person. If not, your blessing shall, your blessing will return to you. Remain in this house, eating and drinking, whatever they set before you. For the workers deserve their pay. Do not move from house to house. God is reversing something. He sent, he sent the 70 out. And he sent them out on the mission. And see, I want to say this. There's no difference between secular work and what we would call ministry work. I've heard people say, well, I want to be in full-time ministry. Wherever you are is your full-time ministry. <clears throat> Whatever job that God has led you to is your full-time ministry. Here, Jesus is sending out 72, and he's telling them, do not carry wallet, no bag, no sandals. Don't even greet anyone along the way. Notice that Jesus equates greeting someone along the way as a distraction. The disciples are commanded not to even greet anyone along the way. The Lord equates having to worry about self-care to a distraction. The enemy attacks finances as a distraction. That's one of the things that we're going to look at that later in the scripture in Matthew. But I want you to see that it's the distraction. God wants us focused. On whatever work it is, whatever area we are, and see, there's different mountains, and I talked about this. Some people call it mountains, some people call it gates, whether it's whether it's uh, uh, finance, whether it's law, whether whatever area it is that God has us in, God wants us focused in that work. And so what God is telling them is don't worry about the provision. Notice there's a reverse because we saw in Genesis, he said, you're going to toil. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be uh, laborious. All of these different things can be equated to that. But the one thing that changed is when we accept Christ and we find ourselves in his will, then the yoke becomes easy and the burden becomes light. When you're in his will. If anyone there, for, if anyone shares, okay, I'm sorry. Verse 8, whenever you enter the city and its people welcome you, eat what they set before you. Heal the sick who are there and say to them, God's kingdom has come upon you. Whenever you enter a city and the people don't welcome you, go out into the streets and say as they complain against you, we brush off the dust of your city that has collected on our feet. But know this, God's kingdom has come upon you. Notice he didn't say wrestle with folk. He didn't say try to convince people. He just said go present the gospel. If they don't receive it, then move on. Because this, you know, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. I assure you that Sodom will be better off on the day of judgment than that city. He said it's better off for them to have been in Sodom than to reject the message of the gospel. Uh, there's a scripture, I want to say it's in Hebrews, and it says, for those who have, uh, I'm paraphrasing, uh, if you willfully sin after you receive the knowledge of the truth. So now people say, well, if you willfully sin, what is it? No, 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 it says willfully sin after you receive the knowledge of the truth. In other words, knowledge of the truth is not you receive the truth. Knowledge of the truth is when someone says, hey, Jesus Christ, he came, he died, he was resurrected, and he died for your sins. You're a sinner, lost, on your way to hell. That's presented with the knowledge of the truth. He said if they reject that, it's better off for them to be in Sodom. He said, how much more sore punishment have they who died and rejected the law and now reject the law of Christ, Jesus? 
So this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. I'm sending you out. Don't worry about provision because the provision is going to be there wherever I cast vision. But sometimes people think easy. Like, no, 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 no. I never said easy in that sense. Because we still live in a fallen world. There's still some challenges. But let's look at let's look at Matthew. Let's tie this in with Matthew here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Usually people start with verse 25. Pack some Bibles if you look at them, they section them out. You know, I never go by that because the, the Bible was written before people were sectioning things out and it was written in its entirety and things of that nature. But let's start at verse 24 because this is a very famous portion of scripture. Notice what Jesus starts out. He says, no man can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth in the common English Bible, but I'm going to read the King James Bible. It says, you cannot serve God and man and man being money. Why did he say that? So now the next verse in verse 25, he says, therefore. So therefore, meaning in light of what I just said, therefore, this is in conjunction. These two words are to be looked at in light of each other. He's saying, don't, you can't serve two masters. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet your, your, for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat and the body more than the raiment? He goes through and he talks about the birds. I'm not going to read through all of this, but he talks about the birds of the air. They don't go out saying, you know, we got to work for this food today. Well, I'm telling you, well, I just don't know. Not and, and, and let's put it in its proper context. I'm not saying that work is bad. I'm saying that the will of God, being in the will of God, finding the will of God for your life causes the ground that you're tilling to work for you. My note here, it says, are you working a job or operating in your purpose? The enemy, the enemy scheme has always been to try to get you to focus in on taking care of yourself and not allowing God to. When you go to work strictly to earn a paycheck, you are serving mammon. When you ask God to reveal your gifts, talents, and assignments and do them, God will provide for you. You feel like a slave when you work for money. When you fulfill, you are fulfilled when you're working for God. There's a difference. There's a big difference. So Jesus is saying, shift your focus. We tell children the wrong thing. We tell them to go into a field that makes money instead of telling them to find their purpose. Telling them to find their calling. Telling them to pursue the thing that God has placed on the inside of them. Sometimes that takes discovery. Sometimes that takes prayer. But we get we put children in the wrong area. That's why you get when you go in the bank. Sometimes you're dealing with some miserable folk. You go to Walmart. You're dealing with some people with an attitude because they're operating outside of the will of God for their life. They're in that spot of just torment and just oh I don't like this job. This, oh man, I just can't. Notice that when people ask people what work they do, they normally refer to it as a field. Adam was asked to till the ground, the field. What field are you in? Because the field, the, 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 the field when you're walking in the anointing of God and when you're in the proper place, the field is no longer cursed. It's blessed and it produces fruit easily. That's why people, when they're operating in their passion, they say, I can do this for no money. If you can do it for no money and the Lord God has put you in that particular place, now you're operating in the blessing. It's going to produce fruit. And not necessarily we think that producing fruit means it's going to produce money. No, it's going to produce joy because you're going to be happy when you do it. You're going to have a smile on your face. You ever meet people in their, in their, in their oper, op, occupation or where they're at and they're just so happy? And it's just a joy to be around them because they're just happy at what they do. I've been at some restaurant and the, and the waitress is just so, oh, hi, how you doing today? Great. Come on in. Sit down. No, 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 no. You're like, oh, 
my God, this is just wonderful. My goodness, I come in here. If you just had hot dogs, I'd come in here just to see that smile. Because they're operating in what they love to do. But then you got the other ones. What you need? Uh, are those tables, those tables dirty? You can't sit over there, but they got some tables in the back. What you, you like, excuse me, is this hospitality or this, did I come in here to be tortured? Did I miss something? Lord, am I in hell? Please just reveal it to me because that's when people are not operating in what God has called them to operate in. And so now instead of, instead of pursuing purpose, they chase mammon. You're serving mammon. Notice what Paul says. Because at the tail end of that verse, and I'm not going to read it, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, in verse 33 of, 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 of Matthew 6. And all these things shall be added unto you. The light bill money going to be added unto you. The, 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 the car note, the house note, the food, is all going to be taken care of when you say, God, what is it that you want me to do? Where is it that you would have me to operate in? I don't want to pursue a career because it has so many so titles and degrees on it. No, I want to pursue what you have for my life. If it's picking up trash on the side of the road, I want to be the best garbage man that I can be. I want to bless some folk along the way. I want to smile at people. I want to be operating in my purpose. So we have to refocus and say, who is my provider really? Is it me? Hopefully not, because we're not capable of providing in the way that God can. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 1. Some of these I may not go through the entire scripture, but I have the scripture up there for you as a note to go back to look at it more in depth. This is Paul, Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. I'm reading out of the common English version, by the way. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord? Aren't you my work in the Lord? Notice what he said. You are my work in the Lord. If I'm not an apostle to others, at least I am to you. You are the seal that shows I'm an apostle. In other words, his work speaks for him. What, what he's doing is saying, he's saying, this is, this is the example of what I am. When people tell you what they are, look at their fruit. I'm an artist, but I, you ain't never seen none of my paintings. I'm an artist, though. I'm a musician, but you ain't never heard none of my music. It's, gonna, it's going to line up. If I'm a servant, who am I serving? Well done, my good and faithful servant. I need to be finding constantly on a regular basis, who can I serve? And see, we think that serving all has to have the same uh, picture to it. Yesterday, we served in one way. We served with the homeless and with clothing and with foods and we partnered with other ministry with showers and everything like that. And I said, that's one element. But see, sometimes we get compartmentalized and we get religious and we say, that's the only way we can serve people. No, stop putting people in the box. Mm -hmm. Find out what your niche is. I spoke with a lady uh, the other day. I want to say, I don't want to butcher her name. I think her name was Christy. I remember Christy. I said, I got to take a picture with you because she had the mobile showers out there and I wanted to know the story behind her mobile showers and I asked her, I said, so how did you, how did you start this? Because usually people do it because it's something personal to them, something they went through or did, you know, something that God, she said, no, just God just told me to start this mobile shower. She said, and I said, my mobile showers and the washer and dryer for the homeless. And as, I, as she was talking, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something. We were out going to Burrell Park all the time and serving in all, all along uh, Nebraska and everything. And one of the things that uh, me and Shantae were talking about one time, well, it would be wonderful for someone to have a mobile shower and washer and dryer. But immediately in my spirit, and see, this is why you have to be sensitive. 
to the spirit. God says, no, that's not for you to do. See, sometimes we, we have an idea and we think that it's God calling us to do something. No, God is just giving you the idea maybe for you to share with someone else and that's their field. You have to wait for the confirmation. Because if not, you can be like Martha. You're doing all of this stuff, wearing yourself out. And God says, no, nah, stay in your lane. I'm going to give you a lane. And so God gave this lady a lane. And I saw how it all came together. Because she said, God gave me this, this, this vision of doing this. And I got with my church leaders and they said, let us go ahead and do it. And God brought it to fruition. And so she's out there. So now here's an event where you have one portion of people supplying clothes. You have another portion of people supplying food. You have another people's, uh, uh, her being a portion that's supplying the showers. That's how the body's supposed to work. The arm can't do everything. That's why we got legs. And so I saw all of that, and it reminded me that God wants people, each and every one of us, in our particular place. I tell people that you will talk to people that others will never have reach into. The people that you work around, people may never meet. That's your mission field. Here's Paul. Talking about there his work. Verse 3, this is my defense against those who criticized me. There were people who were critical of Paul because Paul, of course, didn't walk with Jesus while he was physically on the earth. So now they're saying, how can you be an apostle if you don't meet the criteria according to what we deem the criteria religion? Mm -hmm. You didn't go to the best school. You didn't go to seminary. You didn't sit with Bishop so-and-so. You didn't work on the church board and yet you out here doing the work. Why don't you just let the people do the work? Because sometimes what happens is we can get into religion and stop people from doing God's work and think that because they didn't go to the same protocols that we think they should go through, that they're somehow outside of the will of God. And actually, they're in the will of God. Just don't make sense to us. I'm careful. I, I don't know. Listen, brother, go ahead and do what you, you heard from the Lord. That's what you're supposed to do. Name of Jesus, go forth. Don't we have the right to eat and drink? Don't we have the right to travel with a wife? Who believes like the rest of the apostles, the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who don't have the right not to work for a living? Who joins the army and pays their own way? Paul is saying, listen, when people go out into the army, they don't, they don't say, well, you know what? Y'all going to send me to Afghanistan, so I'm going to figure out how I'm going to get down on the plane and everything. We are an occupying army. God provides for the supplies, the, the weaponry. Everything is supplied for by the person who sends you on the mission. But again, it's in the will of God. Now, I can't go to the army and say, listen, I went to Hawaii, but the commission and the orders didn't come down for me to go to Hawaii, but I'm here now. Y'all send me some money. The army will be like, no, we, we, <laughs> I'm sorry. We didn't send you there. And so I can't go where God didn't send me and then expect for the provision to be there. I got to go where you send me. I got to I gotta understand what it is that you've given me to do. One who joins the army and pays their own way. Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat its fruit. Who shepherds a flock and doesn't drink its milk. God is saying the area that I've called you to will produce. The area that I've called you to will produce. I'm not saying that these things are just based on common sense, am I? He said, I'm not saying this out, out of common sense because some people say, well, that's common sense if you work a few. No, 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 no. This is a spiritual principle. God was showing them that there's a spiritual principle. Doesn't the law itself say these things? If Moses' law is, it's written, in Moses' law, it is written, you will not muzzle the ox while it's threshing. Is God worried about the oxen? Of course not, because the oxen can't understand what the word of God is saying. The oxen is the oxen. Or did he say this entirely for our sake? It is written for our sake, because the one who plows and the one who threshes should each do so with the hope of sharing the produce. If we sow spiritual things in you, is it so much that we ask to harvest some material things for you? If others have these rights over you, do we deserve them all the more? However, 
We have made use of this, oh, excuse me. However, we haven't made use of this right. But we put up with everything so we don't put any obstacle in the way of the gospel. Paul chose not to. In this sense, it was full-time ministry. Paul chose not to at this particular juncture. He said, I could, but I'm not going to because I don't want to create in his, in his particular instance an obstacle for the gospel. And sometimes what that reads is sometimes what people do is, uh, 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 and I've seen this in churches, there's people, you know, they, they, they may be millionaires and this, that, and other, and it's a millionaire homosexual. Well, I ain't going to preach on homosexuality because, <laughs> man, uh, I can't take that. Hit. And so Paul foresaw some of these things. Not that that's a precursor for anyone else, but he saw those things. One of the things that when we started out, and this is just this is just us, again, will of God, our life. God gave me and Shantae a different vision for Hope for Today Ministries, Brandon Christian Academy, and things of that nature. In our very being, we believe that we are to be financers for the kingdom. We're actually praying and actively doing different things so that we would be able to invest in other, and we still, we already do that now, but we invest in other ministries so that they can do the work because it's all about the body of Christ. We know a brother, matter of fact, I thank God for him because one of his uh, 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 ministries was to go into the hospitals. This brother is in full time ministry, and I hate hey, brother bless you because this is something that is needed full time. You cannot do uh, a job and this. He goes into the nursing homes, into the hospitals, and he was there with my mom when she was going through her bed uh, of sickness and everything like that. And then I said, "Well, brother, what do you?" He said, "This is what I do. I walk these wards that they allow me to go into, and I go in. He got a big bottle of oil, and he's just walking through and laying hands and sitting with them and praying with them. And I said, "How much of a blessing is that to be able to do that on a regular basis, but operating in his field? He was called to that field, and God's providing the necessary needs for him to do it. Nursing homes, prisons, he goes into." And so this is what Paul is talking about. Verse 13. Don't know, don't you know that those who serve at the temple get to eat the food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share part of what is sacrificed on the altar? In the same way the Lord commanded those who preach the gospel should get their living from the gospel. But I haven't taken advantage of this. And I am not writing this so that it will be done for me. It's better for me to die than to lose my right to brag about this. And Paul even said, see, and, and this is again, we have to find our field. Still talking about provision, still talking about freedom of provision. Because Paul also said, I would have you be a eunuch. I would have everyone to be as I am without a wife. So I'm not making this as a commandment, but I'm not going to take up that because that's not my portion. My portion was to have a wife. And so Paul was giving that example to give people an understanding of what it means to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. What some churches in life has taught us in the realm of provision. So we're going to look at 1 Timothy 5.8. 1 Timothy 5.8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he have denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, providing provision. So wait a second. I'm in a you're my provider, but how much provision isn't all monetary. Provision has to do with covering. Provide is prenoio in the Greek meaning to care for, to consider, regard, have regard for, also skepsma, meaning clothing, covering, this can refer to shelter 
or other, or excuse me, or personal covering raiment. All provision is not monetary, covering is needed. I say that to say this, I've met people on this journey. I remember many, many years ago being young in the Lord and um, someone came to me for counsel. They had married someone based upon this particular, this was a young lady and it was because of this guy's, his ability to be, his financial status. But then a crisis came. Wasn't really man of God, wasn't really in the church and everything like that. So she was really just going through it, just like, and you're now complaining. And I said, but that's what you chose. See, God ultimately wants us to recognize him as our provider, not man. So what some churches have taught us, and even life has taught us, that once you get married, he's the provider. God can use his provision. He can use him as a channel, but he is not your provider. Why? Because with that sometimes comes manipulation. And then the same way with church hurt is the same way in relational relationship hurt. We tell the, you know, in the community, make sure he got a good job. Make sure he can do this. No, how about make sure he's saved? How about make sure he loved the Lord more than he loved anything else? Make sure that he loved the Lord so much that even if you tell him something that's contradictory to what God told him, he's going to stand flat for it and tell you, no, we're going this way. That's a leader in the household. And so we have to flip this because now the vulnerability of the wife is no longer vulnerable to I'm looking at you as my God because that becomes an idol. You are now my provider. No, God is my provider. Whether you get up and go to work or not, God go make sure that I'm taken care of. So you can't use that as manipulation. Well, I ain't getting you that new purse because you ain't do what I told you. Okay. If God want me to have it, I'm going to have it. Why? Because God is always, let's go back to the beginning. The blessing came from God. Adam, whether he, the work was the same. I cursed the field. I'm the one that can bless the field. I'm the one that can bless the bank account. It ain't what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Don't get it twisted. Because sometimes what we become is we become self-reliant. I don't need God. And that's when God takes people through certain trials and tribulations to show you, I'm going to show you who's God. I don't care if the name of your name is Nations Bank. Nations Bank is not your provider. Whatever health care, whatever it is, whatever the name of the job, that's not your provider. I don't need you to choose a field based on provision. I need you to choose a field based on purpose. I don't need you to choose a mate based on his 401k. I need you to choose a mate based upon what I'm calling you to. Do you have a revelation? Jesus asked his disciples, so, so, uh, uh, what do men say that I am? Some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're Elijah, some say, well, who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, thou art the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Swamin by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Flesh and blood means his biceps, his triceps, vice versa, her, her thighs, her, her, her buttocks. None of that's going to reveal to you who that person is to you other than God. Because the reason why you need that revelation is so that when the trials of life come, because they come in, they come to everybody, you'll stand flat-footed and know and have a revelation that God put this together. No matter what trials or tribulations come, God is our provider. If you got a $100,000 a year job and you lose it tomorrow and God causes you to lose it, I'm not looking to you. We look into our Father because the moment I do that, I'm doing this. I'm doing exactly what the children of Israel did. I'm looking to man. And then I have to tell, and, 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 and this is something, this is liberating. Women need to tell their husbands, look, I know that you can provide, but you are not our provider. Our provider is God. Because now that yoke is on him, like I got to do something that only God can do. And if he's doing it, then the yoke is on him. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I need you to get where God has called you to be. Get in the place where God has called you to be. In Acts, verse 
verses 18, and that's liberating. People are right now going in places that they're miserable, under bondage because they feel like they have to go to a place where God has not called them. And God is saying, if you would just seek my face, pray, wait for me, and do what I told you. Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 1. Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 1. Still looking at Paul. Amplified. Amplified version. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently become, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because the entire because the Roman Emperor Claudius had issued an edict that all Jews were to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. And they worked together, for they were tent makers. There's some people there dual. Paul was dual. I'm an apostle, but I'm also a tent maker. And at this season in his life, he was doing that. But his purpose, if you think about it, his purpose was always connected to the kingdom of God. And he reasoned and debated in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But notice this, watch in verse 5. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, northern Greece, Paul began devoting himself completely to preaching the word. And solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. I know people right now that are called of God to be evangelists that are not doing it because they're allowing their job to stop them. So in essence, their job has become this, that, that golden calf. <clears throat> God is able to give you the ability to do both if we would just seek him. Still talking about freedom of provision because the freedom comes when we recognize that we're not working for a living, we're working for God. Lining up with his will. And the reason why sometimes people, uh, whether, like I said, whether it's churches or whether life has taught us is because God, 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 God's, God's truth is, 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 is light. The enemy tries to add some things uh, to the word of God and make it like bondage. There are some people who abuse these things. In Ezekiel chapter 34, God warns people about abuse. Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34, starting at verse 1. And there's, there's other scriptures in the Bible. In fact, we're going to look at 1 Peter 5 and 1. But, but right now, Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 1, it says... And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, excuse me, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy, and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds for Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? See, churches that, you know, people, they got millions of dollars, and they're doing it full time, but they're not doing it full time for the right reasons. They're doing it full time for that Rolls Royce. They're doing it full time for the million dollar house on Bay Street. They're not feeding the flock. Their concern is not feeding the flock. We saw this during COVID where they said, well, we just going to shut down the door and we ain't going to feed y'all, but y'all keep bringing them ties in. Not concerned about feeding the flock. Not concerned about caring for people. Not concerned about getting outside of the four walls and doing the ministry of Jesus Christ. So they take it and they twist it for their benefit. Ye eat of the fat, and ye clothe you with wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. Abusers, authority abusers. You see them. Got five offerings. And that's just in the parking lot. Well, we got the, you know, the building, building fund, and then we got past in uh, First Lady's uh, vacation uh, offering, and then we got 
Uh, we got the um, birthday offering because they need to go to Italy. And then we got the, uh, the, 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 the First Lady Shoe and Hat Fund. So we're going to raise money for that too. And um, after we done with that, we got the Christmas party. for They private Christmas party. They're going to give us some cookies and milk. But they're going to have a private Christmas party at their house. Yeah. That's abuse. Again, remember what Paul said, ye are my work. So my work is always on display. What I'm doing should be easily visible. What we do is easily visible. The disease, verse four, have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up <coughs> that which was broken, neither have ye brought against that which was driven away. <clears throat> Neither have we sought that which was lost, but with force and cruelty have ye ruled them. I've, I've seen enough of that in my lifetime. People beating up on people. God is very serious about his about, about, about the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And ye were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they came, they became meat to all the beasts of the field, and they were scattered. When the trials of life come, when everything I <clears throat> I've heard people tell me that, you know, when they when they teach or they pre they don't use scripture. And I said, I beg to differ because you need to be able see it's not about me getting up here and talking for an hour and a half, or you don't have no scripture to go back to. Her faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved. This has to become real to you. Amen. It does me, it does no good if it's just real to me. It has to be real to you. And the only way it becomes real to you is when you have a point of reference to go through for the word of God. I've seen people talk about it two hours and they give up two scriptures. And they just talking about, well, you know, I was fishing one day and the Lord told me, uh, you know, and then I went to the mountains of... Uh, and, and all, I've been through that. And when I left out the doors, I had nothing to fight with. This same scattering happened to me because other things drove me away from God. I had no foundation. I had no scripture. I had no revelation of the word of God in how to live and walk it out. I had no power. That's what it's talking about in the scripture. In verse 6, it says, My sheep wandered through the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. That's talking about going out in the streets and the highways and the byways. That's talking about going out and getting the one. The 99. People are so concerned about the 99, and I said, it's the one. God says, I'll send you to the ones. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> In the Amplified. Therefore, I strongly urge elders among you, pastors, spiritual leaders of the church, as, fellow, as a fellow elder and as an eyewitness called to testify of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd and guide and protect the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not motivated for shameful gain, but with wholehearted enthusiasm, not lording it over those assigned to you, to your care, do not be arrogant or overbearing but be examples of Christian living to the flock set a pattern of integrity for your congregation and when the chief shepherd Christ appears you will receive the conqueror's unflating crown of glory it's talking about a kind leader Still speaking the truth, speaking the truth in love, 
speaking the truth in love doesn't mean that we did we don't we, we dodge certain things we don't talk about certain things we don't bring things up we don't we don't confront issues it just means that our whole motive is love he's talking about leaders and we are all leaders because the bible calls us ministers of reconciliation we're constantly trying to reconcile people back to christ that's our mission to reconcile the world back to christ and so we don't abuse that authority that god has given us <clears throat> we keep it in proper perspective this is the last one sure. we got to get out of the way still talking about freedom of provision because the freedom of provision comes when we recognize Lord I just want to be free to do what it is that you've called me to do I just want to be free to be who it is that you've called me to be for such a time as this <clears throat> a man's gift A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before a great man. Gift has already been given. Just have to discover it. Notice that the gift works for you and not the other way around. Adam did not have to go to school to learn how to name animals. He instinctively knew how to do it. There are some things that are instinctive. Creativeness. Kids come into the world with talents and gifts. I've seen some two-year-olds playing the drums like they've been playing, like, like, who taught you that? That's a gift. That's a gift. There's some, there's, I mean, I say that there's spiritual gifts, because I'm, I'm guilty of, of, of spiritual gifts are those that are given by God. There's talents that people can develop, but there's some things that God just gives people, and it's just like, listen, as much as I like to dance and do whatever, I'll never be like Michael Jackson. I'm sorry. Michael Jackson had that particular lane, and that's what God gave him. And understand that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And what that means is, in the Greek, grace, often with the focus on a benefit given to the object. And that's in Romans 11:29. What I mean by that is that the person, whether they repent or not, whether they receive God or not, the gift is there. That's why Beyonce can sing, whether or not she's singing for the Lord or whether she's singing for whoever, she, she came into, she, she's able to do it. And so God doesn't change his mind. The same way with spiritual gifts. People who have an anointing to teach the word of God, to preach the word of God. Some of them are motivational speakers. Some of them are making money on the global circuit and they're selling people all different types of things. And we're like, man, that boy, that can, whatever. Spiritual gift on the inside. Not using it for God. In that sense, if they are called to do what they're called to do, whether it be sales or marketing or whatever, then yes. But a man's gift maketh room for him. The gift that God places on the inside of you makes you indistinguishable. People have to invite you to the table. People cannot do without what it is that you bring to the table because God placed you in the position to be the only one or the only ones that are able to do what it is that you're able to do. You're indispensable. Deuteronomy 8.18 Deuteronomy 8, 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto his fathers, as it is this day. He gives you the power to get wealth. There are people looking for wealth, and they have wealth right on the inside of them. People are looking for something. Man, I wish I had you a caterer. Cook like nobody's business, and you got a catering business on there. That's wealth. You designer, you design stuff. You are, you got ideas. One of the things that I'm reminded of is Dominique when she came out and she did the um, the the uh, the cookie um, make your own cookie. I, I was blown away. I'm like, man, I would have never thought of that. This is make your own cookie. Those are things that God puts on the inside of us. We think that. 
Steve Jobs just came up on uh, with Apple on it. No, God gave him <laughs> deposit. Whether he want to give him glory or not. And sometimes it's for our benefit. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 8. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord God will set thee on high and above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Notice he said you're not chasing anything. The blessings come upon you and overtake you. And if, if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the what field? Blessed shall the fruit of thy body, blessed in the, in the fruit of the ground, in the fruit of the cattle, in the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be the, thy basket and thy store, and blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord thy God shall, the Lord, excuse me, the Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. I'll take care of your enemies. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon the, thee in the, thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God have given thee. What a change from Genesis. I'm, you're cursed. The blessing is in him. It's not in a position. It's not in a job. The blessing is in him. He said, whatsoever you do, it shall prosper. If you listen to me, if you just listen to, see, don't turn to the right or to the left. Listen to me. And gee, one of the things that I like, what God said about Jesus, said, this is my spirit. My, my, my son, my beloved son, hear him. Hear him. See, the, the law and the prophets had their voice. But he said, when Jesus showed up on the scene, all the curses were, listen to him. When he was at the party, he told them, they told, the Mary told, listen, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Why? Because the blessing is there. People are like, oh, where am I going to get this? Or where, how am I going to do this? Or how am I? No, 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 no. Your blessing is in God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Quite a few scriptures out there, but I want us to. Luke 5, 5 and 6. Peter was a fisherman. That was his trade. He was good at it. Came to a point where he didn't do so good. God was showing him a principle. He's showing us a principle. Notice in the beginning, the scripture was saying, toil. He said, you're going to be toiling. Without me, you're going to toil. That's really the thing. Without Jesus, you're going to toil. Without the Holy Spirit, you're going to struggle. You're going to toil. You're going to struggle. Outside of my will, it's going to be hard. Not to say that there's not trials and tribulation in his will. But without him, you're going to toil. I want to toil. <laughs> I just want to be what he asked me to be. When he asked me to be there, doing what he asked me to do. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night. Because Jesus said, let down your net again. I know that that didn't work last night. I know it didn't work last month, last year. I know what you're thinking, that it ain't working, but do it again. Because I am going to show you that it's not because of you. And Simon answered him and said, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nothing has come out of this. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. At thy word. That's what we got. At thy word. Lord, let whatever you say. And if he ain't said nothing, then don't move. We get into this mode where if well, he ain't say nothing, I got to go to plan B, C, D, E, F, G. No, 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 no. If he's this, he's saying that, don't move. That's some of the hardest part because one of the things that the enemy will say by you not doing anything, 
that life is passing you by. That by not doing anything, you need to do something. Because if you don't do something, then this going to happen, and that's going to happen, and everything. And God is saying, be still. Nevertheless, I'm going to let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, fishes. That's going to mess Shantae up. This is not the right part of but this is the Bible. Don't say fish, say fishes. And their net break. Jesus was giving us this example. Find your spot in me. Last couple of scriptures here. Jeremiah 1 5. We know this scripture by heart. Jeremiah 1 5. Jeremiah 1 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Ordained is Natan in Hebrew, also meaning to give, appoint, out, bestow, made. God has made you from the inside out. He's already appointed you to do something. We need to be praying over these babies, these children. Lord God, reveal their appointment. Reveal what they're appointed to do. Reveal what they're ordained to do. We think ordination all the time means that they're ordained in a spiritual sense to where they're ordained to the fivefold ministry. No, there are some things that are ordained before time. He was ordained to be in finance. He was ordained to be in music. He was ordained to do whatever it is that he was ordained to do. And it was easy because God ordained it. Jeremiah didn't have to go to school to be a prophet. It was prophet was already on the inside of him. Jeremiah didn't have to go and learn how to do. He didn't have to struggle and toil to do something. It was already on the inside of him because it comes easy. Final scripture in verse 8, 19. This is why. This is why I'm always constantly and I. When people are at the crossroads, I'm always constantly asking them to pray and ask God where they need to be. Pray and ask God to reveal where it is that you need to be. Why? Because this is going on right now. Romans 8 and 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. The world is waiting on you to get in your proper place. We were a blessed... It was a blessing. I'm going to show you an example. We didn't have a mobile shower, but the Lord placed on a woman's heart over two years ago to start a mobile shower. And because she was in the place where God had called her to do, doing what God called her to do, it was a blessing to the rest of the body of, the, of, the body of Christ. The earnest expectation, the whole creation is waiting for you to play your role. What is your role? What is your place? And guess what? It's easy for her because God called her to do it. So now there's no toil. She went out there, oh, Lord, I'm going to go do this. And then she was just so happy. Just, oh, I just love doing this. This is great because I'm supposed to be doing this. And this is just wonderful. And I just That's right. in the place where she's supposed to be. Gifts are spiritual and talents come through genetics and training. Some people are born with certain talents. Others can acquire them. Play football. Not in the NFL. Not everybody makes it to the NBA. Not to mean that people can't play, but I'm just saying. There's some people that I say, they just got it. They just got a certain talent. Just listen. <laughs> I practice all day long. I'm not going to shoot the ball like Steph Curry. Because if it was a matter of practice, then if everybody could really, really practice really, really hard, and then everybody be like Steph Curry. No, everybody's not like Steph Curry. Because even though they practice, just like Steph Curry do, Steph Curry has something else that God placed on the inside of him. I like to sing. I'm not if I was trying to sing Lady in My Life right now by Michael Jackson, it ain't gonna sound like Michael Jackson. It might sound like my version of Lady in My Life, but it ain't gonna sound like that. God gave him that talent and he enhanced it. But guess what? I can try all I want. I ain't gonna be able to do it. I'm just, I'm just saying. Last part them people ride around there 500 miles an hour, how many miles an hour? That's great. They can do that. That's their gift. That's their talent. Whatever it is. But so, I said all this to say this in closing. Oh, I didn't have the last scripture. I always do that to myself. Sorry about that, y'all. No, 
not sorry, but this is going to be a blessing. God spoke this and reminded me of this scripture. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. And this tablet is acting up again. It's okay. God fed the children of Israel manna every day. You can read it, Joan. Who risked their own necks, endangering their very lives for my life. To them, not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Exodus 16, 4. Oh, <laughs> the New Testament. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will cause bread to rain from heaven for you. The people shall go and gather a day's portion every day so that I may test them to determine whether or not they will walk obediently in my instructions or law. Manna for 40 days I mean not 40 days for 40 years it's like the Lord reminded me of this the manna was never intended to break you but to build your faith and trust in him there are seasons where God says it's not your talents it's not your gifts it's not your education it's not your influence it's not the people surrounding you I'm going to take you through a season where I'm going to give you just enough because I want you to I want to build your faith and trust in me and not in yourself the children of Israel can you imagine that someone saying listen no you ain't gonna have no refrigerator I'm just gonna give you I'm gonna come bring you a meal and then I come bring it at lunch time and I come bring it out I'm not I'm saying that he did that on in that case I'm bringing it to 2021 but he did that so that he would so that we would realize our supplies depend upon him and he does not want our needs, desires, family, friends, or anyone else to be our God. He wants that. He, he the, the, the top of the, the commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so even in that, I cannot pursue something because of monetary gain. I can't hook up with somebody because of finding. I can't do anything outside of what God would have me to do. That's it. That brings freedom. The freedom of knowing, I put that ladder up because people, you know, try to climb the ladder of success. The only ladder of success that we need to be climbing is the one that Jesus Christ has put before us. He said, I press before. He said, I press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. So that's where it's at. Freedom of provision. <clears throat> at this